From the Center for the Study and Teaching of Writing at The Ohio State University, this is Writer's Talk. I'm Doug Dangler. I'm here today at the 2013 Ohio Anna Book Festival, and I am talking to Ellis Avery, who is the author of two novels, Tea House Fire from 2006, and most recently, The Last Nude, which we have here, covered up tastefully for uh, <laughs> YouTube distribution. So welcome, Ellis Avery. Great to be here, thank you so much. Sure, so tell me about um, your latest book, The Last Nude. It is inspired by the Art Deco painter Tamara de Lempica. Tamara de Lempica is, um, was a Russo-Polish painter born in 1898, died in 1980, worked extensively in Paris um, in the 20s and 30s, left 1938, um, but her best work really dates from Paris in the 20s and 30s, and this is her most, one of her most iconic images. This is a self-portrait called Auto Portrait, or <laughs> Tamara in the Green Bugatti, and um, this, and I, I grew up seeing this image a lot. Her, 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 her work was widely uh, licensed, promoted, distributed after her death in 1980, so I grew up seeing this um, in reproduction and not, didn't see it in, a, in the original until 2004 when I went to, I saw a show of her work at the Royal Academy in London, including this painting, which is called Beautiful Raffaella, and this is her most critically acclaimed work. It was called by the Sunday Times of London, one of the most important nudes of the 20th century. And I think it's gorgeous. It uh, kind of references Titian's Venus of Urbino, which is also black, white, red, recumbent nude. Um, but it's but it's very much of its moment. Um, you know, it has this kind of featureless examination table style uh, surface that she's lying on, which which looks kind of you know auto age. You know, it mm -hmm. looks kind of kind of like sleek chrome, twenties and thirties. So anyway, saw this image at the Royal Academy in London. I thought that's a gorgeous painting, and then. I read the caption, and it said that the painter met the model on a walk in the Bois de Boulogne in Paris in 1927, took her back to the studio, and this girl became her model and her lover, and their relationship yielded six paintings. Mm -hmm. And so it's the story, so my novel is the story of their affair from the model's point of view. But what's really moving is that the very last painting that De Lempica was working on in 1980 when she died was a copy of this same 1927 painting. So my novel is also the story of the affair from the model's point of view, but it's also, also the story of the, the painter's last day working on the copy of this painting um, 53 years later in 1980. And so the question is, why was this the last painting she ever made? Mm -hmm. And it may be that she was referencing her early work, doing something that uh, artists that she admired ad admired did, such as Ang uh, revisits his his very early nude scene from behind, right at the very end of his life, or it may be that she had this literally this person and this affair on her mind all those years later. We don't know, but it's but it's the job of fiction writers to choose an interpretation and and make it real. Okay, so when you're handling fiction, but based on real people, mm -hmm. tell me about the kind of research you did. How much did you want to know, or, or converse, how much didn't you, did you not want to know about the people? That's a great question. I read a number of biographies of her, and also read about the era, and then I kind of stopped. Like, she had a daughter who would be in her 90s now, might be alive, might not be alive, I didn't even want to know if her daughter was alive, didn't want to get in touch with her grandchildren. Her, she had a kind of younger best friend in Mexico when she, was, when she, was, when she died, much younger. I could have looked them up, and again, I, I just wanted to draw a line because a novelist's interpretation is, is their own, and I felt like, oh, this is a related point. Shoot, I'll come back to it. Um, shelved over there, um, which so I didn't want to feel beholden to her, her children or grandchildren or friends' interpretations of her life. I didn't want to promote their story or keep their secrets. I really just wanted to know the public person, read the biographies, and then stop and let the novel be my vision of the private person. And what's interesting, taking it off the shelf, is, um, that, you're, is that 
if you are allowed to treat a public figure as a public figure in fiction, if it's clearly fiction, um, in a different way that you, then you're allowed to treat a private figure, um, that the libel laws are different for a public figure and a private figure. And I think maybe that was not, I wasn't thinking about that, but I think that that, that played into how I wound up drawing the line. Like I wanna know her publicly and then her private life is, you know, the Tamara D'Olimpica in my book's private life is, is my vision and her own private life was hers, okay. and that's fine. How does that apply to Raffaella? I mean, was Raffaella then you were able to say, okay, because there's this painting of her, I'm going to treat her as a public person instead of a, a private person and do what I want. Is that how, so if you have a painting, you're, you become public? Because that's, a, I guess that's I ask because great, it becomes yeah. really interesting, um, you know, this will be on YouTube and <laughs> suddenly, you know, are you a public, or I guess you're, I mean, you're already a public person because you've got these successful novels, but where does that become, that's a great question. Like, where does that line Where's the blur? line? Right. And I, I don't know, to be <laughs> honest. Um, I, I would hate to make a, now I'm conscious I'm on YouTube. I don't want to make some sort of distinction. And then people who see this video are like, oh, well, I'm going to write about her. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, write about your. I'm not that public, really. <laughs> um, <laughs> Too late. You wrote the book. Oh, no. Um, now, this but, is. But what's interesting about Rafaela is we don't know much about her at all. We mm -hmm. don't know her last name, we don't know her religion, her, her, her first language, her nationality. I made all of that up. Mm -hmm. We don't even know if literally her name was Rafaela because like I said, Tamara loved Aang and he in turn loved Rafael. And so it may be that she chose, um, hi, um, she's on TV now. And it may be that she chose to call the painting Rafaela to reference Aang and in turn reference Rafael rather mm -hmm. than that the girl's name was actually Rafaela. But, so all we have is these six paintings that are of this nude. We have um, her date book where she has a Rafaela, no last name, and a phone number. Um, and we have a story of her meeting Rafaela in the Bois de Boulogne that her daughter tells her telling, um, which is just, I was walking up the, up the path and she was the most beautiful woman I ever saw in my life. Mm -hmm. So that's all we know and for, for a fiction writer, that's kind of wonderful. Like mm -hmm. I feel like we do three kinds of work. One is sort of dramatizing a biography. We, we work with real things, real people and make them come to life for the reader. One is sort of stepping into the gap where there's someone about whom we know very little like Rafaela and we make things up um, that seem plausible and have a kind of thematic valence. Um, you know, it wasn't her next door neighbor I was interested in, but rather her model, because I was thinking about artists and models and the art making process. And then there's this third kind of work that we do, which is um, counterfactual. I have a character in my novel named Anson Hall, and Anson was the name of Hemingway's paternal grandfather, and Hall was the last name of his maternal grandfather. And Anson Hall is the person Hem Hemingway would have turned out to have become if he never got over the loss of all of his work um, in 1922. His wife brought him all of his work to work on by train, put the little suitcase of all of his work on the train, got off the train to get a bottle of water, came back on the train and the suitcase was gone. Mm. It kind of ended their marriage, you know, but slowly over time. Um, and Hemingway got over it and became Ernest Hemingway, but I think a lot of people wouldn't get over that loss. And so I wanted to imagine who that person would have become in order to think about, sorry, this is such a long answer, in order to think about um, what it takes for an artist to make it. I feel like Tamara gets everything she ever wanted and then stops working. Uh, so she's kind of undone by surfeit. My Hemingway figure, Anson Hall, is sort of undone by loss. Mm -hmm. And it's really my, my fictional character who works in the sort of humble, trivialized and demoted art of fashion who actually does find fulfillment as an artist and, and makes a life at it. Okay. So you've got that as the inspiration. You've got a different picture on the cover. Is there a story to Oh, this how? is the same model. Right, this it's the same model. This is also Raffaella. But it's a different, th if this, this is, is the, the iconic one, how did this one this end up This is called the, the Dream. Okay. Um, Javier Marias had a book come out that had this painting on the cover um, right when they were choosing a cover. And so they wanted to have a cover that wasn't his. And I, I'm behind that. Okay. And I really like that she's meeting your eye. Mm -hmm. And I think that that um, is, 
is important because I'm thinking about the model not just as a as a beautiful, magnificent body, but mm -hmm. also as a as a person. And then once I knew that this was the cover image, this is something I haven't told any interviewer. Um, I went back in and wrote a couple of scenes about this particular image to sort of increase its prominence in the book. Mm -hmm. One of which is she's looking, she's meeting your eye and there's just a little bit of white in her eye and a painter friend of mine taught me, this is kind of an art school trick, like if you want to put the sparkle in somebody's eye, you, you actually put in a little dot of white on their on mm -hmm. their eye. So I had, I, drama, I dramatized that moment. Well, um, as a uh, as sort of an art fool, I'll say that I actually like this, oh. the cover a little better than than that because well. I do like the, the the because I like more realistic mm -hmm. stuff because I'm again an art fool. So I'm an um, art fool too. <laughs> I I chose to write about a representational painter in the 20s and 30s. Who does that? Well, Only what I mean is, is, not is, is that I, I plugged into art history. Right. Yeah. I'm not a particularly good um, art person. I have very little limited visual capacity. And I thought, oh, that's such a cool painting. I remember picking up the book when I started reading it and mm. thought, oh, a cool painting. Mm. Well, well I, I think that she, maybe that she's meeting your eye. Right. It's sort of more inviting to readers. Yeah, uh, and, and she's a great character. Thanks. And Ellis Avery, I thank you very much for being here today on Writer's Talk, and uh, good luck uh, with the uh, the continued success of the, of the book. And um, from the Center for the Study and Teaching of Writing at The Ohio State University, this is Doug Dangler. Keep writing.